What's going on, guys? Welcome back. Another episode of RX Radio. Uh, special one for it's the colliding of RX radios. It's the James's meets the single Jordan. Uh, Jordan Genta couldn't be joining me, but joined today are James Marshall. Just kidding. Hi, James Marshall. We have too many Jameses in the company. James McIntosh and James there. Uh, James Mac coming to us from Hope Island, Australia. Uh, and then they are coming to us from uh, a, a twister in the middle of Kansas, I'm assuming. Um, so we're going to talk all things exercise programming. We're going to talk about trends in the industry, how to simplify your approach um, with novice, intermediate, advanced clients. Uh, these two, when it comes to exercise programming, when it comes to understanding data collection and interpretation and application, there are no two coaches better, in my opinion, at that, which is why... The Jameses will be in September rolling out the fundamentals of exercise programming course through Prescript. Very excited. I've taken a look at the curriculum myself. It's uh, above and beyond anything that's currently out there in the industry to get a fundamental framework and how to organize exercise programming. I, I can't recommend this course enough. And based off of this conversation, you guys will see why. So exercise programming, uh, Fundamentals of Exercise Programming is coming out. Uh, it's currently live for sale at the Prescript site. So www.pre-script.com. Go to the menu page, Courses. You'll see programming there with this nice shiny logo. Probably my favorite logo of all the Prescript courses, if I'm being honest. Not that that necessarily matters, but it fucking matters. Um, so huge shout out to the Jameses for that. Uh, Instagram handles, all that stuff will be in the bio. Um, I'm sure if you guys have listened by now, you know James as they run our Sunday segment of the podcast, the Sunday uh, sermon, if you will. Most people won't. Um, but do enjoy this episode. Me, James Mack, James Thayer, James Marshall in spirit. Shout out James Marshall. Um, and yeah, I hope you guys enjoy the episode. Keep an eye out for the course. It's on the Prescript, li or Pre Prescript site live now. Uh, Prescript exercise programming. So do check it out. Guys, appreciate you tuning in. As always, we'll see you next time. Lundy, hit it. You're tuned in to RX Radio. Uh, do you guys remember the worst program you've ever run? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> do you? It's like specifically? Yeah, like it, like exercise selection, pretty much down to a T. Yeah. Come much. on. All right. Give me, give me like a, give me a week. Give me a week. So and now, and now, hold on. Is this a, is this a Mac original or is this like some small off Russian shit? This is some like men's health, small off Russian, build bigger legs type of program thing that I ran. And essentially, you, you train seven days a week. You're so tuning into RX so Radio. You'd start whatever your Movement body part was for the day. You would start with. Brought to you by Prescript.com. Five, by five power clean as heaviest as you could on one day and the following day would then be five sets of 20 reps as heaviest please so welcome your hosts jordan shallow every jordan time. jinta and you would just run Killian hamilton power clean that you said power clean that you said power clean and just keep going on top of what else you were running on that day as well so for those of you new to the wednesday segment <laughs> of the podcast uh my friend james mcintosh uh has had a hip replacement <laughs> <laughs> probably unrelated <laughs> probably unre i wonder if you could send the bill the like muscular development magazine or whatever the fuck that was yeah that's a really d now I, how old were you and how long did that last for before and you're like eh nah 15 yeah. and i ran an entire sports season out of that so that was like oh, full, oh shit yeah, yeah full uh winter season semester if you were of like our school so that's a third of the year so four months four months of that every day on top of two uh, uh what was it one f one age group field hockey team session which is an hour and a half plus then a division one men's field hockey and an mma session as well on top of that and then a gym session so there was four sessions within the day five days a week plus this added on top it was it was great great Again, as you say this, I kind of understand why I might have a hip replacement at the age of 21. Makes sense. Yeah. What about you there? Do you, do you have any like, man, that was really dumb? Um, pretty much my whole juco time during football, any of the training sessions were terrible. Bas basically, we just had this like 
five foot four angry quarterback coach that ran our sessions that just wanted to brutalize people. Like one of one of the sessions, uh, what was it called? Man makers or whatever, where you get in yeah, groups of three. <laughs> you get in groups of three based on like position and weight. And it's a hang clean, um, hang clean to a front squat, to a push press, to a back squat. And oh. everyone in the group had a hundred of those. And then afterwards, <laughs> we uh, split up offense and defense and did farmer carry races with a hundred pounds in each hand, handing them off and broke half the walls in this two year old weight room. So yeah, that, that one's pretty vivid, man. I don't know. If, I didn't know if I have ever had that. Like, I think I did like squat every day yeah. for a little bit, but I don't know yeah. that's, though, that's, that's biblically dumb. That's like, yeah. <laughs> that's when did you, okay. Like when, I guess, when was the realization? Because Mac, like you're 15, you're playing sport, like you're in school. When was it that, like, what was the light bulb moment when it clicked and you're like, oh, that was dumb? Because obviously, like, it you didn't click beforehand. Otherwise, we'd hope you wouldn't do it. Like, what was it that like led you down the road to be like, oh, okay, I know enough now to be like, what the fuck was I thinking? I think it just injuries. Honest, like injury, yeah. injury <laughs> injuries, 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 yeah. real quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But pain is knowledge, real fast. Like that's pretty much what happened. Um, I just I tore my hamstring. No shit. Like tore my hamstring at a running on the field, and I was game over. And I had a uh, shout out Kerry Ann. Long story, but a chiropractor who spoke some sense into me. <laughs> uh, uh, I love medical professionals. <laughs> I just so good um yeah so uh, she kind of was like the the realization of oh this is probably not a good idea um in saying that though i probably continue to do really stupid shit like i the squat every day program still occurred i had torsion a couple times from you know lifting in the suit which we've realized is probably not a good thing either so i think it's more to like those the, at home what torsion is <laughs> So torsion and torsion <laughs> is where in the male side, size specimen, whatever, a proper man if we were. Well, oh, we're going to get cancelled. Go on then. You double <laughs> um, down. Where, you own it now. <laughs> just don't know. It's just, <laughs> it's, just uh, it's where your testicle turns within the sack, essentially. Um, oh. within the scrotum. And it... it um, blocks blood flow supply to the testicle and it balloons like an elephant <laughs> yeah 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 it was great my left <laughs> testicle just like started swelling up after a i think i hit like 225 for a single so that's kilograms not freedom units <laughs> in, yeah, they, i'm not that it weak. matters it does matter 225 yeah in a single in the suit and i remember hitting the hole and i was like oh that's that was uncomfortable and it was okay just but you know achy and about an hour later, like I went to the bathroom and I looked down and my left nut was blue and very big. And then I had the awkward like, oh, I need to go to the hospital. You know, that's always never a good time. And I just had a very uh, blunt, very straight down the line female nurse who just walked in, shifted my junk to the side like it didn't matter, which hurt more than the, the testicle. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just like me get this yeah. sausage out the way type scenario and just uh, had a look and was like, yep, you've got torsion. Um, did an ultrasound, which was just as painful. And they were like, well, here's the, the options. Pain relief, anti inflam And we hope like hell it turns back or you're going into the operating theater and they have to turn it back and then sew the testicle back in place. Otherwise it, yeah, yeah. Every male listening to this right now, thank God. It worked and it turned back. Subsequently, three years later, same thing happened again, uh, hitting a deadlift. Um, same thing. So yeah, I, I, it's not a fun time at all. It's a shitty experience. Oh my but god! Again, now what, what are you there? Like what? What, what brought I've you to the light? Definitely never had my testicle turn. Dude, I wouldn't no. be in fitness anymore. I'd be in some yoga retreat in <laughs> the south of India. 
Uh, um, well, because luckily, like, whenever I had a really good um, high school and junior high program, so like for what it, it was good for what it were was like the bigger, faster, stronger esque is kind of what they ran off with a little bit of variation. So had a good enough introduction that whenever I got into JUCO into their programming, I was like, this is horrid. Um, that session that I mentioned earlier coming, like, I think everyone on the team had scrapes down their necks, the, their hands were torn to shit. And it's like, nobody's going to be able to do anything for practice tomorrow. This is dumb. So I think that was the big, like, luckily that coach got fired for some other shit later on that year. So sounds about right. Yeah, I think it's more the, the realization. Did you start like asking the question? Because that's what I found myself going. It's like, why am I getting injured? And then I started like really diving down or auditing like what I was doing. I think that's that was my light bulb after the injuries. It's like, well, I keep getting injured. Like I can't be that fucking stupid that I ha- keep getting hurt. There's got to be something that I'm doing wrong. I think that's where I then started looking at what was going on. See, I think at that time for me, I was getting close to potential injury because I'd I'd been through like football season, wrestling track. So I knew what it was to practice and play never at a hundred percent. But during that first season, I was like, no, nah, this isn't right. Like, yeah. Yeah. It kind of makes sense, I guess. Now what's the common shit that you guys see now? Like I, I would say from an outward coaching perspective, like in the industry, I know I always get this. It's like, well, I, I've, I've worked with like everyone, and you're kind of like a, a a last resort. It's like, oh, okay, thanks very much. But in that, that comes with a bit of pressure, right? Like if someone works with you and they've worked with everyone else and self-proclaimed to have tried everything else, you're like, well, fuck, I better have a distinctly different method or vehicle of delivery. Otherwise, we're going to arrive in the same place. Um, now, like for me, when I, that that pro, that you know situation gets posed, it's just a matter of like, okay, well, tell me what those things are. And then that's where I start to gain a lot of like market research. I'm like, wow, there's a lot yeah. of like misunderstanding. And, you know, more often than not, these misunderstandings are common, right? Like the, there's some common things that percent. What do you guys see in the exercise programming world that is perpetually misunderstood? I think one of the big things um, that we've talked about before is a lot of times people will look at an issue start trying to program towards the side effects and not really not really try to reestablish what the issue is a lot of times like pain compensation things like that that they're not necessarily addressing what's going on they're just addressing the side effects that they're finding and with that i think a lot of coaches are it kind of goes twofold either they're just they keep adding to it instead of having having the confidence in how they're programming to be able to swap things and not just keep stacking things on top of the program. So it like running, that's where you get into the 20, 30 minutes of warming up just to try to exercise, or you get the other end of it where something happens and a coach doesn't, a coach, a trainer doesn't know what to do, doesn't know how to utilize variations and they just strip everything. Like they, instead of the like, the deload now becomes the program where we just step away from everything. We pull the weight, we pull the movement because we we're scared and we don't have answers on how to address that. But I think with that part of it is like the education side of it is having the knowledge of how to do the step down, not a step away. Right. So like the big issue is just like not understanding load management through exercise selection and just being like, we really only have two buckets that we pull from like squat, bench, dead leg, press, squat, extension, lunge, bench press, overhead press, barbell shit, or bird dog curl upside plank. Yeah. And there's not that the gradation in between those two, those two buckets. Yeah. And it's also like, so part of that, like, I think we've termed it before we spoke about it before. It's that it's treat the, patient not the monitor and what that means is like the symptoms are everything we see on the monitor <clears throat> instead of looking at what's going on with that actual person in front of us so the symptoms are the pain the inability to do the exercise or inability to perform these maybe higher progressed movements instead of looking at the person in front of us and going okay what assessments do we like let's start with the assessments let's start with the intake which starts with 
one, what can we do? Where's the dysfunction? Two, what have we done? It's like that's probably one of the big things that we miss or that I've seen missed with so many other trainers or people that come to you at that last resort. It's like, oh, I'm just going to start you with what I know instead of going, hold on, let's look back six months, a year, year and a half. What sport did you play when you were growing up? It's like because of that, that gives us clues to what we would see now or what we can see now. So it's like not looking far enough back and assessing from a program down to, you know, how many sets were we completing in a week? Like what type of movement patterns were we prioritizing versus not? It's like this, that gives you such a good starting point to then build out a long-term model with the person that you have in front. And that's probably the second side of, of all of this is everyone wants that instant result right now. And yeah, we need to get people out of pain as fast as possible. We need to get people progressing towards a positive adaptation whatever that is in terms of their goal as fast as possible but understand that that needs to fit into the long-term plan of what we need to accomplish yeah i think like the history taking side is something that always like blows people back like it's you yeah. know the reason we finish the psl1 course with like a detailed history taking is like because if we're going to look at the index like looking at indexing exercises from the ability to load it's like, well, you better be able to uh, like uh, know the know the letters of the alphabet so that we can search these indexes appropriately, right? Like, if you don't understand like where to meet someone where they're at, then you just in inevitably flip between these two bookends of like, oh, we can't squat bench dead, and we end up in this perpetual deload step away, um, yep. rather than you know just being meeting able to them think, where right, they're well, at. Yeah, I mean, what is the minimum effective dose? What is the minimum effective load that we can that we can titrate down to through exercise? Like, what is the maximum amount of regression needed to get someone moving out of pain? And then how do we just, like, use frequency, intensity, duration, or time, distance, load, or, you know, velocity, endurance, and intensity, whatever metric you want to use to progress or regress within the confines of a single exercise, then you know as we make progressions there understand that that exercise is limited in its ability to express those adaptations and the best way to move through that is know the mechanism that that exercise represents and then know its progressive counterpart as something that will then unlock another uh, level of loadability duration velocity whatever so it's like yeah looking at exercises through like this like not even necessarily like a lock and key, but rather thinking about what are the individual tumblers within the barrel of that lock that we need to manipulate and in what sequence so we can really pick this lock door and unlock progressions for people in pain. Because yeah, like history taking is, is such a lost art. And it's like, if you, want, if, you, if you are a coach on the internet right now and your process does not involve a history taking, like an in-depth history taking, you're not coaching, you're programming. Yeah, 100%. And that's like you're saying it. It seems to be getting better. We see it, and I think that's, you know, testament to what's going on within the prescript community and like specifically PSL one going through that history taking. It's like we see coaches asking what you've done, but also then probably not far enough back. Like that in depth history taking is the key thing there. It's like it's not hey, what program have you just come off, or like were you doing an accumulation block beforehand? Okay, what did you do before that? What was the intention? Where in our whole periodization model were we? What was our macro? Like that's where we need to try and like shift the industry towards. So taking a further history from that versus, hey, oh cool, you just came from an accumulation block. Well, that tells me that I shouldn't give you another accumulation block and give you an intensive case. No, it's more than that. It should be more than that because you're going to run the runway for progression is only so long. Then what? What do we do after that? You can't just keep loading someone. So I, I think, yeah, a testament to us in seeing better questions being asked, but I still think it's now taking the questions that are being better asked and like, okay, how do we now go forward? What's the plan? Well, in Shallow, I think you brought up a really good point is the we looked at we looked at the difference between coaching and programming that programming is reps and sets and it loses that key element of the person you're doing it for. And that's really what we were looking at through kind of the prescript lens is how to integrate that coaching into programming principles. 
throughout the whole continuum of the process, not only off of the history intake, but also off of the initial assessment, the continue, the continuation of assessing the person as they go through progressions, understanding what's going on with their life, not just what's going on at the gym. So you can factor those into how are they recovering? What are some of the stressors that they have that need to be, need to be thought about and put into um, the program to help constrain somebody or like look at whenever somebody, if somebody has a vacation coming up, like we need to be mindful of that because programming is going to change. It's not going to be the same week to week. And that shouldn't be the expectation that we have as coaches. It's understanding the life of the person that you're programming for and being able to adapt it around what's going on for them. I think that's really where we saw a huge impact that we could make is by really bringing in that thought process of how can I coach for this person, not just how can I make a program and kind of hand it off. Yeah, I think, Mac, when you were talking about like the monitor and the patient, like it, it's an analogy that reigns true when you look at exercise, because exercise programming, understanding like maybe to stick with a more medical reference, like understanding the interactions that exercise have in the same way like drugs would interact, right? Like there's a certain way to like order exercises and there's a certain predictability like that's why exercises have names. So we can say one thing without talking about the, you know, the individual relative fatigue incurred at certain tissues and certain muscles and certain ligaments. Like I know what a squat is. And when I say a squat, there's a certain level of like glute and a certain level of quad and a certain level of stress at the back and a certain load ability and a certain, you know, benchmark for skill. And I could quantify all of these or enumerate all of these and do it relative to, uh, you know, every other exercise and be like, well, it's, two points on low back where deadlift is eight points on low back and deadlift is one point on quad where it's back squat is 10 points on quad and deadlift is six points on glute and squat is five points on glute or whatever. And like we can enumerate that in a very binary fashion or we can just say squat and deadlift, right? And understand in the back end, like if we look at the tumblers within that barrel of what's stopping someone from unlocking that next level, that next progression, that next increase in weight or next... Uh, you know, metric of uh, of progress, we can just say one exercise and we understand what that means from an execution standpoint. So it's a matter of like, you know, using, you know, programming principles, like you need to know what the fucking monitor says, right? Yeah. Like if the, if the EKG runs flat, you need to know what that means. You need yeah. to know it's like, yo, I don't give, when the EKG runs flat, I would imagine it's like, okay, the person is non-responsive. And, but the most important information is like, me, like yeah. that's really it, like. There's a reason and, why there's a noise that goes off in the fucking <laughs> monitor. <laughs> so like, to yeah. remind you, look at it. Yeah. Like that's what it's and for. And here's you know? the thing, like, God, the <clears throat> damn son of a bitch. The number of times I've heard people use the word lifestyle coach in the last week, I'm going to jump off a fucking moving train because here's some Someone who doesn't know how to read the monitor and you have clients flatlining and it's just yeah. like they're just looking at the like, oh he's just asleep it's like no he's dead motherfucker he's dead and look at the screen the screen will tell you that his heart is no longer working and it's just like and those are people who are afraid they're afraid of or they're hyper aware of their inability to assess that that metric side of programming because you know, programming is the understanding of that screen. And it's like coaching is the interaction that you have with your clients that all like adjusts your behavior accordingly. And depending on the level of your client, you're going to weigh in and create like a coefficient between that subjective and objective between the screen and the patient, right? So you yeah. can start to, cause like, and I think the more advanced, yeah, I'm purposeful overreaching for athletes in an off season is something that I do often, especially motherfuckers are taking off for like a week to Cancun. It's like, guess what? You're going to need that week because I'm going to yep. bury you for the first, like for the 12 days leading into it. You're going to have two a day sessions. So it's like, yeah, I'm looking at the screen to make sure he doesn't flatline. And he's telling me like, oh, blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, yeah, I get that. But if, you know, Sally May soccer mom starts hitting me up and it's like, Oh, you know, the kids are in dance lessons now and the minivan broke down. It's like, I, I don't give a fuck about the screen. It's like, okay, Sally Mae, like, well, I'm looking at you, dog. Like, let, let, let's, let's, let's work the problem. 
Let's me and you work yeah, the problem, and rather like fuck a screen. You're not flatline. You know we're conscious. You know what's your what, what? Who's the president? What day is it right now? Like what's your middle name? All that shit. And it's just that is like you know if you want to talk about the art of coaching, there's so many people that try and teach, in my opinion, the soft skills of like communication. It's like man, I don't think you can teach that. I think you can have an awareness of how it is that you interact with people and have an awareness of yourself as a person and have your own style of communicating and draw people in towards an authentic way of communicating. But like, there's a lot of people out there who sell this idea of, and I don't want this to be too like direct or pointed at someone, but like this idea that, you know, coaches like they don't know how to communicate. So like, we got to work on our empathy. It's like, you sound like a psychopath. <laughs> Work empathy is like an inherent human emotion. Like if you are working on that and like faking that and making that an inauthentic pursuit to help like bolster your gaps in knowledge around how do we actually communicate, which is how we communicate with our clients is through reps and sets, right? Like 98% of communication is nonverbal. And guess what? That movement selection, exercise order, understanding frequency, volume, intensity, duration, rest periods, all that, that is our, those are our, those are our nonverbal tools of communication with our clients, right? It's like, yeah. yeah, you know your fucking client's dog's name, whatever, but it's like, you know, we need to understand the role that the screen and the patient play based off of the outcome of, you know, the desired outcome and the, and the level that the client's at because that's something that's very pervasive right now is exercise programming is just like thing that's super generalized in a way to just talk about someone's feelings. It's like, you're not a shrink, you're a coach, sort it out. Yeah, it's, but that's it. It's it's the reps and the sets, and the, it's the way that you communicate with your client is through those exercises or that exercise selection. The problem is, and this is where we took this model and then found it almost falling short in a way, is that people then didn't understand that, okay, I can talk to you now, but I need to know how to talk to you in six months' time. Or I need to know what language we could have progressed to, for example. And what I mean by that is like, what is the progression or what is the intention behind what we're going to be doing to achieve your goal at that stage? So what we we kept having this like backlash or this uh, pushback against it is, okay, I have my client for 12 weeks now. So I know how to speak to them within this exercise selection, hopefully for 12 weeks. But what do I do after that? Because they don't want to stay that I don't know that they're going to stay with me for longer than 12 weeks so we came up with like this this thought process around okay how do we take a traditional if you were strength and conditioning model around you know long-term periodization of creating like a macro cycle you know if you were 52 weeks maybe a year maybe two years whatever it is and how do we allow ourselves to be able to talk to your client now and for the next 12 weeks if we were but fill that into a phase that then creates a block. And this is part of like the language that we want to bring across in terms of the, the programming course. It's like this phase becomes, you know, an intention for a block that then makes up this long-term ability to keep talking to our clients to then reach their goal. Because otherwise we're just throwing shit or a shotgun approach at your client with this exercise selection. And they get to the end of the 12 weeks and they go, I want to con keep, con keep continuing to communicate with you but what would we do and you as the coach or what we, the feedback we got was well now i don't really know what to do because i kind of gave them my all for 12 weeks instead of being like okay i've got this long-term vision for you to get to your goal get the, the the goal to be achieved but i know right now we can't i can't throw everything at you to get you there we have to go through these phases and go through these blocks to be able to get you there but keep making progress with all of these other factors, keep looking at the monitor, keep understanding the interactions going on with the different drugs, if we were in there, and keep the monitor going, but make you, you know, work towards your goal. And yeah, kind of in that model, go ahead. Go I was ahead. just going to say, kind kind of in that model, it it puts the onus on the coach to start looking ahead because it shouldn't be up. The client has a goal and maybe a want, but they don't know how to get there. That's why they're coming to you. So it, it puts the responsibility on the coach as it should be to, hey, you need to be looking ahead to figure out how to use the intention of these phases to reverse engineer it back 
So you might be starting at that 12 week package that they purchased, but that 12 week package uses the phases to continue to build towards this long term progression of success because we it's a, a term that or a saying that we actually took from you was clarity of vision, fluidity of process. It's if you know the direction and the path that you need to go, you can be fluid in the steps that you take, the distance or the time it takes. And that's really where we try to work in the phase is it's not hard set of, hey, this has to be a three to four week and then you have to move to the next thing. It goes off of not only the coach being able to assess where their client is, being able to meet them, but also using that to hey, they need to extend a little bit into this phase. We need to, maybe we need to spend a little bit more time in a GPP phase because that's where the client is right now. And we need to get them more proficient at the movement to be able to progress to more difficult exercises or even to be able to touch load or, um, or reps or sets. And so with, with that, the coach kind of looking forward to be able to reverse engineer back and work off whatever they're given based on the session packages, based on the time that they have available. But like um, like Mac was saying, it starts that conversation right now because something else with trainers, they're terrible salespeople. Right. By and large, any of them working in a commercial gym, like if you do your initial assessment and it's the free assessment, if you wait till the very end to now mention pricing and packages, You've already lost that like that. It doesn't have to be built up into this big sale because you communicate that throughout the whole session and similar to trying to get a client to reuptake on a on working with you on that continued communication. You're talking about the direction you're going to go. Hey, we have these 12 sessions to work together in 52 weeks. This is where I want to go. This is the time we need to get there. This is where we're at right now. But the conversation isn't at the 12th session. Be like, hey, do you want to sign up now? Here's all the things. It's over 12 weeks or whatever it is. We've been talking about this. We've been pointing towards the direction that we want to go. We have that vision. It's clear and we're working towards that. This just gives us the opportunity to continue that conversation to meet those goals. Yeah, I mean, grooming that experience is such so useful because your clients, I mean, you're not your client and in so many ways like you know to steal a backsism to, to to know what it's like and none of us will ever in our lifetime know what it's like to be weaker than gravity like to know the limitations that come both mental and physical with being you know detrained is not something that people who who train understand and with that becomes a, a very like even the psychological state of someone entering a gym who doesn't train is like I take it for granted. I mean, I walk into a gym. I'm the old man now. Like I've I've been I've seen it all. I've seen it everywhere. Like there's nothing that surprised me in the gym anymore. Like name a situation. I was from from fights to guns to knives to sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Like I've seen it. You know, I've seen guys rip yay right off a fucking plate before they bench. Like it, that's whatever. But to see that as someone who's like uh, January first, you know, New Year, New Me. It's like. <laughs> some guy just fucking rips half an eight ball off of three plates and it's like, holy shit. And then for you to be the shepherd in that situation and be like, I know the way. And like, here's where, you know, we're going to, we're going to be in, in 12, 12 weeks and how that 12 weeks fits into a, a bigger cycle. Like just being able to sell through a competent ability of your own skills is really the only way I've ever been able to sell training. Cause like, I don't know sales tactics. I think they're cheap. I think they're malicious. And I think they're ways that people who don't understand the the nuances of the job have to lean on, you know, pain points of someone who's in that position who might give up their money for this service. It's like I've never sold anyone on, you know, my uh, like a package or anything like that. It's like I, I'm selling you understanding. I'm selling you peace of mind is what I'm selling you. Right. I'm selling yeah. you my ability to work the problem and to solve the problem. And I think from a business perspective, like and there's so much out there right now, fucking one thing worse than a lifestyle coach is a goddamn business coach. Right. Like I, I both think they just, just have a hollow point solution. Like there's no more predatory a cocksucker in this industry than a goddamn business coach right now, because there's no better tool in business coaching 
than really giving the confidence and competency to a coach to be able to be that shepherd for a client and be like, yeah, look, we can work the problem. And here's what the problems we're going to run into and being able to shine some light on this for these people. Like we really take for granted. I think if you watch people first time in the gym who are not in shape, like the, the, the psychological hurdle that that is, that's your true barrier to entry is being able to overcome that, that hurdle. And the only way in my experience, and I'm sure, look, the salespeople know how to, you know, push pain points and all that, but like, from a long lasting, like if we're going to look at this problem, like something that needs to be solved over the course of years or a lifetime, it's like we need to know what that lifetime or that life cycle of training, programming, coaching looks like. And if you can, if you can portray that or communicate that, I'm not necessarily a super empathetic person. When I talk to people about fitness, I'm very cut and dry. It's nice that I've worked myself into a corner where I work with people who you know, don't need a lot of the emotionally stuff. But I've been able to sell hyper emotional people with the confidence of my ability to talk about, you know, how I can overcome and work the problems that they're inevitably going to run into that comfort that they derive from me who's relatively cold in the way I deliver this stuff. And I, I got better over the years. But as a kid, it was just like, like, here's the go. And for someone to take the reins for them was like, oh, shit, fuck, thank God. Yeah, here, or whatever, all sign. Right. Because like people don't. People are looking for their problems to be solved and not just 12 weeks. So I think from a business perspective, it's one of the best things that someone can invest in is, you know, we all get pretty clever with execution, setup, stabilization. That's great. But if you can't, if you can't lay out a roadmap for your clients to follow, it's like you're not going to have many clients. Yeah. Or, or you'll have, you know, this constant return or constant flow of, just in and out and churn and churn and churn. It's like the life cycle is so fo- short in that perspective. Like we want you to have, imagine how much time and effort can, well, do you put into getting a, and acquiring a client? It's quite a lot. Once you've got that client done, if you keep them for the next 52 weeks, whatever, it's like, hey, I don't have to go and try and get another client. I can put all my effort that I would to getting a new client into this client in front of me give them a better service, get a better result, get a better outcome. And by doing that, I generally keep them with me for longer if they need to be. Like if we achieve the goal and they want to continue and they want to start a new goal, cool. I print out the periodization model and I map out the next 52 weeks of what we need to try and do and what phases we have to go through and what blocks need to be kind of achieved. And it it just gives us the roadmap, like you said. We can put or pave that roadmap in front of the person and show them where you as the coach are going to lead them, you've got them bought in for that whole period of time, no matter what. Now it's just your job to kind of get the results. Yeah, and I think from that is is another great business play, right? Because if you keep someone for 52 weeks, it's going to be 52 weeks of them telling their friends about the results they're getting, 52 weeks of reposts on the gram, 52 weeks of results that you fostered under your guidance. And then all of a sudden it's like, you're gonna have a wait list, right? Yep. Coaches that don't like, not to say that you need a wait list to be a good coach, but is, you know, if you do, if you can, if you're in it for the long haul, it's like, that's what people want. Like people don't want to get into training for 12 weeks, right? People, people inherently know that this is a lifestyle thing that they want to adopt and they want to enjoy. And the way they do that is by seeing results. And so it's like, you know, from an acquisition and retention standpoint to kind of like you know, paraphrase what you were saying earlier back, it's like understanding exercise programming is probably the single most valuable tool you can do f- or you can have for your business to minimizing your acquisition costs and improving your retention rates. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say. You just said it much better than I did. <laughs> <laughs> that's, why we, that's why we do this. Well, and I think... Again, it just highlights the point of being able to get clients, being able to program based on your competency and skill as a coach and not fear mongering. Because I think we see that a lot in the industry too of, yeah, that, yeah, that look exactly that, that you don't have, you're doing a bad job if you're selling fear and like, that's your go-to. Whereas if you're confident, if you know what you're doing, you can reveal the path and give the direction and help lead the way for that instead of just trying to accumulate these people of just fear-based mentality to continue to sign up because they don't want to get hurt or they don't want to 
they're afraid to do certain things instead of opening the door to the potential of opportunity by showing them, hey, we can accomplish this. We can do more. You're not limited to these options. There's more to life than just staying in this little box. Yeah, I think hope trumps fear 10, 10 times out of 10 every day of the week. And I think if you can sell that and that's the, the roadmap out, like I always think of like the, uh, a lot of like the, uh, the Batman movie where they got to jump out of the giant hole. If you think of that, like, because that that hope is is weaponized, and it's like if you're a good coach, you can make that leap for your client, right? You can prove that it can be done, and if you have a strategy to pull them out of that hole, they've been sitting in the bottom of that hole for a really long time, and it likely, if you know, the hard part with diligent coaches, they usually don't pay attention to the visceral outward facing things that are going to entice someone to work with them. And that's why they often get deprioritized to the bottom of the list. And it's always the last person, you know, that someone turns to to get results. And it's like, that's that's fine because, you know, the shit rolls downhill. And if you get really good at giving these people who have uh, sort of been, uh, you know, proxy to this shitty service, if you can give them hope and then give them results, it's like you can really change the way that they, they look at exercise fundamentally. Um, because oftentimes it is like, oh, I have 12 weeks. I need to put on this dog and pony show. And there's, you know, there's swings and flows and animals, this and kettlebell, whatever. It's just like, then, yeah, the, the, where do you, what are your magic tricks after that? Right. You yeah. pulled the rabbit out of the hat. We know where, we know what card is your card. And it's like, do you want me to show you the, 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 the coin behind the ear? I think it's again, like, dude, are you out of tricks in 12 weeks? Are you fucking joking me? Right. Rather than having like this stratified tiered level approach that builds upon itself, not only for the sake of, you know, clients uh, results, but also like maintaining, maintaining interest in, and maintaining buy in in the process. Like, I think there's so many parallels to like optimizing your approach to business and optimizing your approach to results. And I think a lot of people just look outside of exercise programming to optimize their business. And it's like everything you need to know is in everything you need to do and, and nothing else. And so it, it's always like frustrating to me to see people turn to, you know, and invest, not even invest, because investment would be learning how exercise programming works at a nuanced level. Donating your money to people from a business perspective, it's like, you're still going to run into the same, you know, logic traps of your misunderstanding of how this whole system comes together in the long term or even in the short term. So it's like it's been such for me, like to realize that the more I knew about exercise programming and, and its effect on like, you know, or how we assess the screen and the patient, as it were, the better my personal training business started to do. And that's like and the more I invested into understanding exercise periodization programming and all that, the better my business did. So like I never had to look at a business coach or any sort of, you know, bullshit ancillary service like that because I could just, you know, I had a fucking ridiculous wait list because I just knew how the thing I was supposed to be good at, how it worked and how to do it. Like it does, it's not much more complicated than that. No, you just mastered the thing that gets results. It's it. funny that it's it's funny how that actually <laughs> <laughs> helps you, you know, make a better business yeah yeah i think there's there's such a there's such a need for that paradigm shift in the social media space obviously like storytelling and authenticity and integrity are things that like you know those might be hard to teach but if your main focus like you know if if the performance of your client is your ultimate proxy and you do and exhaust your resources and efforts to improve or expedite their ability to um, to reach those performance goals and make it both an objective and subjective improvement i i don't know i i don't know a better tool to have you know i don't know i don't think click funnels is going to do it I don't think the difference between slide post versus reels, like reels. you shouldn't give a fuck about the algorithm if you know how to program. Like yeah. and programming to, to the algorithm is like algorithm kryptonite. It just, you can't fuck with it. You can't touch it. It kills the algorithm in the sense of like your actual bottom line of your business. Yeah, it's exactly it. It just, it, it completely obliterates it because you're too busy focusing on getting your clients results that you don't have to worry about fucking 
if it is a slide post or whatever a reel or whatever it is like you you're busy working in your business not on anything else what are like if you had to pick one aspect of your programming um that you think is integral and obviously this is tough because they're so uh you know they have such a tensegrity relationship to one another but either some, something you do in your exercise programming that you believe if more people understood would be better or if there's one thing that you could not do without in the in the pursuit of creating an exercise program what would it be for me it's it's that what we've just kind of said it's the the clarity of vision fluidity of process it's like just take that thought process there front load all of your work with your client's goal and that in itself self-organizes what needs to happen within the program within the periodization model if you spend more time on that you can spend less time having to do you know make new programs or think about what you did previously to then go forward it's like you can actually coach you can do real-time solutions right there it's quick it's easy it's like we've you've spoken about this before like having a plan never works but it's the fact of that you have the plan and you've made so many plans every time that when the plan fucks up, you have a new plan like this straight away because you know exactly where we're going, but it's the fluidity of the process, the fluidity of these phases that we've created in this model that allows you to just keep the ship going. I think I'd kind of build off of that too, is just like simplifying the process that, <clears throat> that in having an in-depth, exercise index you understand how to transcend between one exercise to the other and your programming doesn't look like random chaos where i'm jumping from this big exercise to the next big exercise we can see the long-term progression to get from one spot to the next spot but also keeping it simple like the realization i think one of the big things that stuck for me with just prescript in general was the two tenets of stability, like center of mass, basis support, either devi deviate the center of mass, make a longer or shorter lever, and expand or reduce the basis support. That's progression and regression simplified. Apply that to any situation that you're working on with your client. Right there in a real-time solution, you have the ability to create a movement solution just based on one of those principles and applying it. And now it's gone from, as a coach, I'm lost because I had this plan and this exercise and I don't know what comes next to, I can simp I can make it simple to be able to follow, to continue to progress and be, but it also comes from that coach going and expanding that index on their own and understanding how these things work together and how there is that connectivity between exercise through position through um you know force production things like that it's whenever coaches don't kind of explore that a little bit on their own they get so stuck in this is an exercise in isolation this is an exercise in isolation with no path forward or backwards yeah i think understanding the how the interaction or the relatability of how exercises not only are different, but also probably more importantly, how exercises are similar, right? Like minimizing redundancy in the program by having very clear uh, outlines of like, okay, this exercise loads these tissues at this relative intensity. And it's obviously it's like all subjective and, and, and subjective to interpretation. But I think that's one of the things that having a robust framework around building exercise programming it minimizes all the noise of extraneous or, you know, duplicated exercise selection and maybe not duplicated in the sense that, you know, you're doing two leg presses, but if you don't really understand the mechanics of a hack squat and this hack squat is kind of a little bit more horizontal or this leg press is a little bit more, uh, vertical and it's like, well, you're kind of just doing the same thing. You're loading the same tissues over and over and over again. And it's like, I think that's where, you know, one of these models, or having such a robust model uh, as is in the course is that it minimizes redundancy and it actually buys back time for you to start to, you know, progress and regress different, not uh, different or complementary adaptations, right? Like a lot of people will chase 
you know, the same, chase the same carrot for an hour. And it's like, you could achieve that stimulus required in 10 minutes if you knew what exactly you were chasing, right? And you know the most expedient route to take. So you can look at, you know, and this is where most of your clients are look, hey, yeah, I want to look better naked. Okay, what does that look like? Right, like it, it looks at maybe building some sort of work capacity, having something that looks like uh, an increasing ability to recover. It looks at, you know, overall motor unit recruitment. It looks at, you know, isolated bouts of, uh, of higher volume, uh, you know, tissue load from a, a metabolic perspective. And it's like sometimes, you know, you can, if you know how to chase those things independently through exercise, you can, you can really make some, some meaningful strides in a single session towards those goals and string a few of those sessions together and watch your clients really transform like you know right in front of your eyes and then you know you don't need to do all this extraneous other shit it's writing like intent based exercise programming rather than exercise based exercise programming which is probably one of the hardest paradigm shifts but when we understand you know not where to stick the key but rather how each individual tumbler in the barrel is playing a role in unlocking you know, the progressions in our clients, you know, the goal is to not be, uh, you know, a guy with a key. The goal is to be a locksmith, in my opinion, and, and understanding the fundamentals of exercise programming is so important in acquiring that skill as a coach. Yeah, pretty much and, it. And I think, I think that's part of the conversation around understanding those individual tumblers is seeing programming through a larger sense that this is the selections that we make load management should play into it fatigue management recoverability like those all need to be factors that contribute into how we're organizing and how we're selecting that a lot of times like you said i think it's somebody just with the key looking to stick it in and try to unlock it instead of instead of knowing the fine details to to open up potential impossibilities yeah, because like I look at it from a mechanistic perspective, and I think you know I love this analogy of like dogs thinking that barking unlocks doors, right? And I think a lot of coaches. But the thing is, and I, you know, I I love a good analogy. That that initial because it's you know it's it's a very common way to describe you know uh, the importance of understanding mechanisms. That analogy usually ends as the person with the key. But that analogy, if you really play it out in real time, and the goal of a coach is, yes, most coaches are at the level where they think, you know, barking opens doors in the sense that if they do something long enough, if they do something heavy enough, if they do something hard enough, if they do something on short enough rest periods or frequent enough that, you know, they will unlock that adaptation. And then I think, you know, the, the industry has, you know, by and large, and it's hard to realize that some days has gotten somewhat smarter. And most people will look at that scenario and be like, oh no, silly dog, you want to be the guy with the key. But there's no other demeaning feel. There's no greater demeaning feeling in the world than being the prick that left his fucking keys on the kitchen table. And then it's the guy who really doesn't understand how locks work because he's got to call a real guy that understands how locks work, right? So it's like the locksmith that pulls out the pick set and the flashlight and then breaks into your crib in 30 seconds is like that guy knows how locks work, right? You just, you should know where your keys are and sometimes you forgot where you put them. So it's like the goal shouldn't be, you know, yes, the industry is a bunch of dogs barking at doors, hoping that they unlock these adaptations. But I think, you know, if training is ever going to be what it can be at the level of intervention, we have to set our sights on being locksmiths and being able to understand these mechanisms and then sequentially putting them together so that we can unlock these adaptations. Because like results are something that, yeah, long term, you know, we're always going to move the goalposts. There's always a new horizon. It's definitely like part of our it's part of our biochemistry to to operate at that level. Like, but we can reach horizons very quickly if we know how to navigate this terrain. Right. So that's uh, that's something that I think Again, from a business perspective, talking a little bit more directly about the programming course, a lot of people don't have the confidence to string these things together and merely are, are masquerading as confident with a bunch of keys. But it's like, unless you know how those tumblers interact, you're not going to reach those horizons really quickly. You're not going to unlock those doors really quickly. 
And the second you start doing that, that's where, you know, the, that experience of doing that allows you to start to be, you know, more forward and confident in the way you portray your services and, you know, be able to get better results uh, as a consequence of that. And then that in itself speaks for itself. And then your business begins to, you know, uh, steamroll as a byproduct because sales is fundamentally one of the issues that I think drives continuing education. People are like, I don't know enough. That's why. I'm not, that's why I'm not successful as a coach. And it's like, well, maybe you just don't know the right shit. Yeah, I find it, they're just not going, they're, they're not asking the right questions to then fill the knowledge base that they're missing. And that's why we've created this course in the way we have and we're creating it in the offering we are because you can be a very advanced trainer and still kind of put these things in or you can be just qualified and you can come in and learn this principle based to programming and apply it on both ends, sorry, um, on both ends and fucking be able to actually make a, a meaningful impact in your business. That's the goal of this course is we can give, you can be in a class with highly intellectual individuals that have been in this for a very long time, or you can just be coming into the industry. If we get you now in the industry and we teach you this from the very beginning, you're setting yourself up for long-term success right all right so let's talk about the course september prescript programming yep we're gonna have uh two lectures a week same lecture different time zone uh yep. we're looking at 10 10 weeks eight about eight, eight weeks yeah about so eight, about eight, eight, weeks. eight weeks with with the fluidity of process <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. The, the the essence of the course built into the delivery of the course. It's art. Yeah. So it'll be at least eight weeks is probably what we'll put <laughs> in the course material. And then with that, you know, like all prescript courses, you're going to get access to the prescript collective, which will allow you to strike up dialogue with obviously the Jameses, as well as the community of prescript coaches. I think there there's rarely something in the collective in the discord channel that when you know peeled back a layer or two doesn't land somewhere in the realm of exercise programming right when we see you know a technique in isolation the first thing a diligent coach does is you know what are the interactions right what is this technique interacting with what is this exercise interacting with as far as its contemporary exercise in the current training block at hand uh, so I, I i'm looking forward to i mean obviously you know, we, we've been working on this course. Uh, you guys have been working on this course for some time now, but I think the real value is going to come in the discussions that stem from this because there are rules, right? Locksmiths arrive at this this point in understanding mechanisms and sequentially fulfilling these criteria that, you know, a, a lot of times if we have this collective, no pun intended, if we have this collective effort, you know, accumulating so much experience we can really start to Rosetta Stone how it is we navigate, you know, organizing exercises um, for clients of different levels, of clients of different levels looking to achieve different goals. Like, uh, that's what I'm most excited about is, is going to be, you know, the, the communal aspect, as always with everything we put out. The community aspect is always the part that rips. Um, but, yeah, so we're looking September registration. Um, so, you know, guys, the, it's up for sale now on the website. So if it's something that you're interested in, we actually have a programming webinar. So feel free to check that out. If you haven't uh, been able to sign up, just send us an email. We'll get that over to you. Obviously, the Jameses run the Sunday podcast. Um, so, if, you know, this is your first time. If you're just a Wednesday guy or gal, be sure to check out the RX radio on uh, on Sundays as well with them. And then in the meantime, guys, any closing notes before we wrap on the day? Just uh, excited to see you in lectures. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say uh, this is like definitely something that's been in the works for a while, and we're putting out a product that we're really proud of, and we think is going to have a big impact on coaches, on coaches, on trainers, and really get them to like start thinking and adapting how they approach programming. Yeah, I think that nails it. All right, gent gentlemen. Appreciate your time as always. We'll see you. I don't know. I'm probably going to text both of you before the night's out anyways. Um, but yeah, I appreciate you guys putting this together. It's definitely going to be something that rounds off our, our curriculum moving into the end of this year and moving forward into what I'm sure will be, you know, advanced principles of programming 
spoiler alert, uh, in, in 2023. <laughs> um, so guys, I'll see you on the podcast on Sundays. I appreciate your time as always. Uh, and we'll see you guys uh, next episode at RX Radio. So appreciate you guys tuning in.